Hello and welcome to Unabridged, the weekly podcast where teachers take on books. This is Sarah. Join us for bookish episodes and a monthly book club pick. This is Ashley. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or go to our website, unabridgedpod.com, where the books we read are linked for purchase. This is Jen. Check out our Teachers Pay Teachers store, our Patreon page, and our newsletter. Please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts to support us. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hey, and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 172. Today is our April book club. We are discussing Eric Gansworth's Apple Skin to the Core. Before we get started today, we just wanted to remind you that a great way for you to support the podcast is to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. That helps us so much. And we love the reviews that we see on there. And we are able to share those with you all on our episodes. And so if you would just take a minute to rate and subscribe, that's a big help. And then if you have an extra minute and you can do the review as well, we appreciate that too. So like I said, we're going to be talking about Eric Gansworth's Apple Skin to the Core, which is a memoir in verse. And we're excited to discuss that. But before we get into our book club discussion, we wanted to share our bookish check-in. Jen, what are you reading? So I am reading Caitlin Greenidge's Liberty. And this one will have just come out when this episode releases. I have an early copy thanks to Algonquin. And I am just loving it. So I was excited to get my hands on this one because I really loved Greenidge's first book, We Love You, Charlie Freeman. I thought it was this brilliant mix of historical fiction from a really personal perspective with a little bit, <laughs> the fiction part maybe should be emphasized. And this one is similar. So this one is about a girl, Liberty Sampson, who is a freeborn Black girl living in New York with her mother. And this is based on a real Black female doctor. It starts right before the Civil War, but I have not gotten there yet. But I know that the bulk of the book takes place during Reconstruction. And the real doctor began a hospital in this predominantly Black town in New York. And her daughter, Liberty, was starting to follow in her footsteps, but then eventually realized that she did not feel like that was for her. And because of the synopsis, I know that she's going to go to Haiti eventually. Again, (laughs) I'm not quite there yet. So I know that there's this whole part of the book that I haven't gotten to. But what I'm really loving about this one is just, it's all from Liberty's perspective. And she has this great admiration for her mother who is raising her by herself. Her father, Liberty's father died when she was young. And Liberty's mom is this brilliant woman that the town just admires so much. And yet as the book is progressing, Liberty is starting to see the areas where her mom is vulnerable and where maybe she needs some care and support. And so it's just really interesting. I feel like we all have that moment when we realize our parents might be amazing, but they are also human beings. And I'm just really loving seeing Liberty work through that and work through what she wants her path in life to be. So again, that is Caitlin Greenidge's Liberty. And hopefully I will have a more full review. I'm hoping to do this one on the website because I think I just love it so far. But again, I'm still pretty early. I'm like in the first 25%. So that sounds amazing. I am wanting to read more historical fiction and things that explore different time periods. And it sounds like it's great for that. And then how interesting that it's also based on a real person. I'm hoping there's a good author's note. That's one of my favorite parts of historical fiction is when there's the author's note and they talk about the decisions that they made about what to keep and what to change. And if not, I'll be Googling to find out more. Yeah, that's awesome. (laughs) What about you, Sarah? What are you reading? I am reading Taylor Jenkins Reads After I Do. We, <laughs> Jen frantically texts us one day when we, this book was on sale for a little bit over $2. And so I ordered it and, and I immediately started it when I received it because I, I love Taylor Jenkins Reed. And this is the story of Lauren and Ryan. They met in college and fell in love and They've been married, I believe, like 11 years, and they are starting to not be able to stand each other, kind of. Their their relationship is not what it used to be, and they decide that they are going to take one a year off and that they cannot contact each other. So I am at the part where they've 
they've separated. They're not even calling it a separation. They're just taking like a one year hiatus from their marriage. And the only stipulation is that they, that they can't be in contact with one another. They have taken the hiatus and Lauren is starting to look at what her life would be, or it's kind of tra- already exploring what her life would be if she weren't in a marriage. And I, I actually like it. I normally do not like this premise. There's a book called The Arrangement by Sarah Dunn, which had very high praise, but and, and it's very well written, but I... Just could not get on board with the that plot of that book, which was basically they they took a break from their marriage. However, they were still living in the same home and all that stuff. So usually I don't like that plot line, but I love Taylor Jenkins Reid and I trust her with really complex and complicated relationships. So, so far, I'm not put off by this at all. So I'm hoping that it will continue to be that way and that the outcome will be satisfying. So I'm about halfway through and I'm really enjoying it. And I just, I think she, she has the ability to capture you from page one. And I, I have lots of other obligations and I just find, I just keep wanting to go to read that one, but I'm trying to pace it so that I can also get what I have to get done in my reading finished, but also reading that on the side. So (laughs) So that is Taylor Jenkins reads after I do. Well, I am very excited about that one. (laughs) As you said, I got it in the mail and it actually has been a long time since I purchased a print book. And so I've been doing a lot of eBooks lately. And so it was really nice to get it in the mail and I'm really looking forward to reading it. That's interesting. I didn't know anything about the premise. I knew that it was $2 and 36 cents or whatever it was. (laughs) That's what I knew about it and that I loved her, but that's really cool. I think one thing about the couple in this book versus the couple in the arrangement that I was talking about is that this, that Lauren and Ryan don't have any children, whereas the couple in the arrangement has two young children. So I think that that is as a mother and, and a person who is in a marriage, that is really hard for me to disentangle what that could do to my children. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know. So that's just kind of my take, but I didn't realize that was the plot until I started it. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> but, but so far so good. I trust Taylor Jenkins. Reed. Yeah. Three for three. I also bought it just because of the price <laughs> and because it's, it's her. And so when you were describing it, I was like, Oh, that does sound interesting. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Ashley? What are you reading right now? So one of the books that I am reading, I was so excited to start last night, is Nicola Yoon's Instructions for Dancing. This one is coming out on June 1st, and I am reading an e-galley thanks to NetGalley. And I wanted to get ahead. Sarah was talking about reading deadlines. I really got behind in March between the things I needed to read for the podcast and also the things that, and for reading challenges, and then also the things that I had committed to read for NetGalley, I felt very frantic and bogged down. And so this one isn't coming out for a while, but I actually have multiple books that I want to read for that June 1st deadline. That is going to be a big pub day. There are some major, in fact, I think that's Taylor Jenkins Reads day as well for Malibu Rising. And there are a couple of others that I'm planning to read that I'm sure I'll share on here later. But anyway, so lots of great books coming out that day. And I just wanted to get ahead. So, and also I absolutely love Nicola Yoon. Like Sarah was saying about Taylor Jenkins Reid, Nicola Yoon is another one that for me, I am immediately engrossed. I have never been disappointed. It's very easy to get into her books. And so even coming off of this kind of feeling of being bogged down by a lot of what I was reading, even the ones I've loved, it was good to start something fresh that it was immediately inviting. So I haven't read very much of it yet. I just started it a little bit last night, but immediately when it opens, you meet Evie and her family, her sister Donica and her mom. And she is going through her extensive romance book selection in her house, and Evie is, and she is donating them all to the library. And she talks through the, it it was funny that this comes up because we just did a tropes episode recently and talked about our favorite tropes. And so she goes through her former favorite tropes and talks about why she liked each one and what she liked about them. And so she was this huge romance book lover and 
suddenly is repulsed by the romances. And then it becomes apparent very quickly in the opening scene that her mom and dad are getting a divorce and that her dad cheated on her mom. And you can tell that she feels that her sister Donica and her mom are just able to, they're baking and it's this really fun scene and they have flour everywhere. And you can really tell that she feels that they're just moving on, that they're moving forward. They seem completely unimpacted. And for her, she feels like her whole world has exploded and that everything that she thought about the world is not as it is. And that the love that she's always admired in stories and wanted to have in her own life is suddenly not real because seeing her parents' relationship that she really idolized fall apart in such a dramatic way has made her reconsider her whole existence, basically, and her viewpoint on the world. And so that's the opening scene, and I love her, and I think that it's interesting to see those dynamics. And I I appreciate right at the beginning that I think all of those reactions that we're seeing between her mom and her sister and herself, that all of those are reactions that happen to that kind of traumatic event. And so I appreciate how that's playing out. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. I did talk about this one. This was a highly anticipated read for me for 2021. And so I know a little bit about some other things that come with the dance studio that's close by and how she kind of gets drug into that. So I'm excited to see where it goes. So again, that's Nicola Yoon's Instructions for Dancing and it's coming out on June 1st. I cannot wait to read that one. I've not picked up the e-galley yet, but it's on my list to start soon. I was really excited to dive in last night. Among other things, I needed to start something new last night (laughs) and and felt some pressure to share something new with you all. And then I was like, oh, this one's perfect because I knew. And that's why I think she's so reliable for me as an author. I knew that I could do that and have a lot of fun reading it. So as I shared in the beginning, we're going to be talking today about a memoir in verse. And this is Eric Gansworth's work that came out not so long ago. It was 2020, and it has gotten a lot of awards, and we're so excited to discuss this one with you. I wanted to open up with a quick summary for routine listeners. I did, in fact, write a summary this time. I always forget and have to impromptu share one, but I wrote (laughs) one this time. And so this is what it's about. In this memoir and verse, Eric Gansworth, an enrolled Onondaga writer and artist who grew up in a Tuscarora reservation in New York State, shares about his life experience growing up on a reservation and then moving to a city as an adult. From the publisher, the term apple is a slur in Native communities across the country. It's for someone supposedly red on the outside, white on the inside. So I wanted to include that from the publisher because... I did not know that about the term. Perhaps other people do, but I felt like that was important and I was glad to know that going into the book. So finally, Gansworth's poems explore his relationship to his family, his perspective on the long range impact of oppressive systems such as residential schools and his own fight to find his way as an artist and a writer. So ladies, let's start with our overall impressions. Sarah, how did you feel about it? I thought that it was really clever the way that he incorporated music and albums in the map of the book, you know, that it was anchored by that and his love of music and art. And I found a lot of it very interesting about his family and just the lack of knowledge and he had about his history and how he really had to dig that dig through that. And I really liked all the imagery with the photographs and talking about like things being missing and having to find them. And just the fact that throughout his life, he lost so many things that meant so much. And one thing that really struck me about his life on the reservation is that the stuff about the electricity and the Mm. fact that he, they had house fires multiple times. I mean, most people don't experience that hopefully in a life once ever in a lifetime. And I mean, he talked about the fires on the reservation because of faulty electricity and the fact that there were mice that were chewing through this, through the cords and all of that. And 
the fact that it, that was just normal that, that they lost everything several times in a fire that that just really stood out to me. So I just thought it was a fascinating in terms of learning about his life growing up on the reservation, the people that tried to hold him back and to, and not let him spread his wings and do what he wanted. So I thought all of that was really powerful and thought that he really communicated very explicitly how difficult it was to grow up on the reservation. Yeah. Yeah. That about the fire struck me too. And just the way that all of the things that caused harm, how exposed he was to danger. And that that was so pervasive for some, I mean, the Skywalkers as jobs, when he yes. works in the metal to pick out the metals and he's constantly mm -hmm. cutting himself, Yeah, all yes. of those things. And then there are so many of them that had the physical scars from burns, from the fires. I mean, I thought all of that was really striking and how mm -hmm. not, not just the impact for him as a person, but also for the community as a whole. Yeah. What about you, Jen? What was your overall impression? So I really loved it. I did think it was quite different from what I expected. So I think so many of the memoirs and verse I've read recently have this strong narrative through line, this push, and it feels as if it's a novel in verse. I mean, that's what I kept thinking of. And this is very different. So I thought, first of all, that was just different from what I expected. It was much more individual poems that were definitely linked by a common theme but they were quite separate. And so my brain turned to how can I use this in the classroom? And so I kept thinking about, I, I thought it was interesting the way he experimented with different poetic styles through the book. And I loved the fact that it was multi-genre and that you could see how powerful, Sarah mentioned this too, that these some of them were photographs, but then there were also paintings and drawings that he had done and the way that that was all related to losses he had experienced in his life and that this was his attempt to recreate memory and recreate his past. So I thought all of that was really well done and really interesting. And yeah, I mean, there were, I know we're going to get to what worked for us. And so a lot of the things that worked for me were individual themes, but I did just think he said several times he emphasized that this is his story, just emphasizing that there is no one universal story. I, I think sometimes we want like the universal Native American story or the universal story for this entire tribe. And he kept saying, this is my story and emphasizing that individualistic perspective, which I really appreciate it. And I think is important to acknowledge. So yeah, there were a lot of things. I mean, I used a huge number of, of book darts because <laughs> there kept being, there were just these quotations that I just kept turning back to. It's beautiful writing. So yeah, I really loved it, even though I did have to adjust my expectations when I started the book. Yeah. How about you, Ashley? Yeah, I think a lot of what you all are saying resonates. I agree, Jen, that when I started, I have been accustomed to novels in verse or even a memoir in verse moving in that narrative way. And so I was surprised to read a collection that, that does read a lot more like a traditional poetry collection. So there is, in the sense that each poem stands alone, there is continuity. You can see his thoughtfulness in the way that he put together the parts with the art, with the titles, that all of that works together as a whole. But I agree with that snapshot kind of approach was different than what I expected at first. And just as an aside, but something I think is relevant is I started listening and I am a big listener on audio. Sarah and Jen always tease about how fast I can listen. And I do like 2.0 is my standard, but I can go up to three. So I listen very quickly normally and can kind of pump through and hold those things in my mind. And I found that that just didn't work with this. I loved hearing his voice. And there were parts that I listened to that were so moving. Hearing him read in both languages, I loved that. That was really powerful as an auditory experience. But in general, I was much more effective as a reader on the page. So I just wanted to mention that, that that was an observation I made. I had access, I think we all did, because of Libro FM. And I love it because it's him. And we always talk about how powerful it is to hear the author. So in that sense, I did really love hearing his voice. But I found myself 
much more able to connect and retain what he was sharing by reading it on the page. So yeah, so in general, I thought it was really powerful. I love poetry and I love the way it can connect the individual to the larger community. And I think we really see that here, the movement from his his own experiences, which as Jen said, were are very unique to him but also his attempts to connect to his community and to the larger world. And I thought all of that worked really well. So we want to talk just a little bit about a specific thing that worked for us. And then we'd like to share, like Jen said, it's, there are so many beautiful quotes. We're going to each share a quote that, that specifically worked for us. So Jen, what's something that worked for you specifically? So, Going back to that idea that this is his story, I thought one thing that was really interesting was his consideration of the way that different traditions that he is aware of have been blended between tribes. And so some of that, like Ashley mentioned in the summary, that he is his tradition through his mother is Onondaga, but they grew up on a Tuscarora reservation. And he talks a lot about being an outsider because of that heritage. And he talks about the fact that there are particular dances that people do that have pulled from different traditions of different tribes throughout the United States and that we don't think about it anymore. And yet there are parts of things that people will want to change or modify because of the modern world. And others will get really indignant because they want to hold on to this pure idea of what that culture is. And so I just thought that was a really interesting idea to wrestle with. I think he is working so hard to make sure we know that this is a living culture, that it's not something we're looking back on and over idealizing and that it's not this big mythic tradition, that this is a tradition and a culture that is alive right now and that that means it has to change and grow. And so the way he was wrestling with what is he doing to hold on to things that matter and knowledge that matters? Ashley, you mentioned the language. It, I think that was really brilliant, but then also that it has to be open to change because it can't be static and still be that living culture. So that's really complex. That's a thread that's woven throughout the book. And I just really, it made me think a lot. I really loved that consideration. Yeah. I, I think that he made some really powerful observations there. I thought often of Tommy Warren just there, there mm -hmm. and the discussion, I think that theme of the connection between a longstanding heritage that has gone on for a very long period of time, but also a movement into a present. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And yeah, I thought that that consideration throughout was one of the threads that really did feel it had some narrative movement to it. What about you, Sarah? What's one thing that worked for you? I really thought the way that he talked about his childhood and how he was encouraged to kind of tamp down his, his culture and assimilate to white culture. And uh, one, the one thing that really stood out to me was when they did the, the traditional dances and he didn't have a ribbon shirt and he, I mean, you could tell throughout the whole book that he just thirsts, he was so thirsty for knowing all these things about his culture. And he recognized the fact that when some of the older people in his family and in his life died, that the, their stories died with them. And because he wasn't encouraged to know about, he wasn't encouraged to seek that out even though he had that desire, it just was really, to me, very poignant and very sad because he wanted so much to know, but he wasn't able to ask. And I think that I liked seeing how as he got older, he was able to break away from those expectations that he had as a child and, and find out more about his culture and continue. And he finally got a ribbon shirt. I really like mm -hmm. that full circle moment when his friend made him the, the ribbon shirt. And I also really like that community feel of that. He, she wanted him to draw her wedding invitations because he's a fantastic artist and that it was difficult for him because he never drew animals. So he tried and tried. And then that she made a ribbon shirt and he really didn't know much about making a ribbon shirt. So he told her what he wanted and it was really difficult for her because it was more intricate than all the other ribbon shirts. I just really like that whole 
mm-hmm. full circle moment and that he got the ribbon shirt and it was even better than all the other ribbon shirts. I just, I thought that was great. So I really enjoyed learning all about that. And I really enjoyed learning about his life growing up and then how he kind of made changes to make a life that he wanted to live. Mm-hmm. So that's what I appreciated him talking about his niece and nephew who mm-hmm. knew so much and had been encouraged to learn and were really working to make recordings of people speaking the yes. language so that it's not lost. And these different traditions that they are very intentionally learning to hold on to. Yeah. I thought that I, I agree. I love that whole part. I also love that whole relationship when he would babysit with them and they would dress up like kiss and they tried to put the <laughs> toothpaste for the white paint and he said it burned their eyes. I thought all oh, that was really endearing and just such a precious thing to share with us as readers. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Ashley? What is one thing that worked for you? Yeah, I'm torn because there are two things that are really coming to my mind. And one is about the long range impact of the residential schools and the way that he traces back what that meant for his family specifically, who was impacted and in what ways and how that shaped them as adults who then raised their own children. I thought that was really fascinating. But the other thing I wanted to comment on was pop culture. I think I'm going to go that route instead and just say that I loved the way he explored Indians and pop culture and how that changed over time, but also how white pop culture, how he as an as an individual trying to find his own identity as a native person, as a, you know, as an outsider on the reservation, like all of those things, how he related to these kind of larger cultural icons. And I thought all that was fascinating. So, you know, it struck me about Star Wars and his connection to the outsider and that idea of what that meant for him. And then, you know, we've already mentioned about the Beatles and how closely he followed that music and then how he looked at their progression and what happened and them falling apart as a band and what all that meant. And yeah, I just thought all of that was Oh, the Batman. The Batman. Oh, my gosh. I I almost chose. That was one of my contenders for my quote about the when he wanted to wear it as an adult and and was being warned not to wear it out. And at first he thought it was kind of a joke and then realized that, you know, in some ways it wasn't. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, like, I think that that exploration was so fascinating and could be studied on its own within the work. And I liked it also because I think that it's something that as a culture, when I think about Halloween costumes and stuff, like we just still have a lot to learn as a society and white people in America have a lot to learn about what it means to honor someone's heritage as opposed to appropriating it and misusing it or making making light of something that is really important. I mean, I think all of that I thought was really fascinating and that we saw that at work with all the references to pop culture over time. I think he does a really great job of exploring that throughout his childhood and then, you know, into present day. So that really worked for me. I do want to say it is so funny that Ashley picked pop culture because out of the three of us, <laughs> she's always, she's always says, she always has the disclaimer is pop culture. I'm not, that's not my best thing. And she picked pop culture to work for you. So I just, I feel that's a win for the pop culture junkies. <laughs> well, and I think part of what I liked, and maybe that, maybe that is why it resonated for me is just his view of himself as an outsider, but that he's still impacted by those societal icons. And so, yeah, I think it's really interesting. We There are many things we could discuss, but we always try to pin it down here. So we're going to talk a little bit about quotes, and then we'd like to share our pairings with you. Sarah, what's a quote that you selected? Well, I selected two, but I'm only going to read one. I just couldn't decide at the moment. <laughs> but I think I'm going to go with this one. It says, when we are born outsiders, we sometimes find bridges we can make with our own stories, embracing the ways they are connected instead of pointing out the gaps between the two sides. And I just thought that was just a beautiful quote. And this is toward the end of the book. And it just, I felt like it showed so much 
about how he grew as an individual over the course of the story he is telling us. And I just, I just really, I really love that quote. Yeah. I had that one too. It's one of my choices. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And I liked how, so there's a refrain that comes up throughout about choices being made that they're hard to live with that often you're outsiders and that I'm paraphrasing, but that part comes up several times. And what I really loved is like you're saying, Sarah, that I saw that as a really transformative moment for him, that something that had ended with this pretty significant limitation, even right before that quote that you shared, he says, we learn this early and are reminded often, some reminders are harder to receive than others. And so there's that refrain that in various versions comes up over and over again. But then in that moment that you shared, I just thought it was him coming outside of that and being at yeah. peace with mm -hmm. what those feelings are and what that is meant for him and how he's found this bridge forward. And so I just thought, oh, that was really beautiful. What about you, Jen? What's your quote? So, yeah, I, I also had two. I will only do one. I do want to start a little earlier just to give it context. So this is a quotation from his grandmother who was in one of the residential schools. He talks a lot about how those schools impacted all four of his grandparents and she says, your job at the school was to start over, be a blank slate. And then I'm skipping some lines. And then she says, you are being wiped clean so that whatever reservoir of information you retain will only reference a certain version of American culture, the melting pot that does not melt. And when you open your mouth to teach your children what you know, you discover there is no blanket to go back to. It has been pulled away from you one thread at a time unraveled as you worked in stables and shops as farmhands and domestics until what you hold in your hand is not even enough thread to tie your hair back. It doesn't matter as your hair is no longer a length that needs restraining. And I just, I thought that was such a brilliant way to show the insidiousness of this practice and the deliberate nature with which the government tried to strip language and culture and long hair from these children so that then when they did return to their homes, they had lost that part of their identity. Every part of it was gone. And yeah, so that is a really sad one. I, I should have chosen something more hopeful, but I, I felt like that resonated for me throughout the book. And again, that's something he returns to again and again, is just the impact that that generational loss of knowledge had had it, for him and for his nieces and nephews. And yeah, that just continued. Yes. I thought that that part about, I mean, I know I've referenced it a couple of times, but I thought all of that about the long range impact of residential schools and what that looked like was really powerful in the way that we see from his grandparents' own words, the impact that it has on them, even in, in their you know, in their, in his present, the things that they shared with him and how he just quoted those things directly. I thought all that was really rich and really powerful and just horrendous. I mean, it is horrendous. The practice was horrifying and the way that they were tricked into agreeing to send their children, believing they were giving them a better life. I just thought all of that showed it for what it was and that's how it should be. But I think that even with wide reading. I mean, I think all three of us try to read pretty widely that I still have not seen a lot of accounts that show exactly how horrific residential schools were. And so I appreciated that. Again, we're seeing it, how it spells out, not just for the those of them that were impacted by the going, but then how it impacted their families for generations. And so, yeah, I mean, really heartbreaking, but important. How about you, Ashley? What's your quote? So I had a couple chosen and then I'm going to bail and do a different one. So there's, <laughs> there's so many. And I think what I really love is looking at the way that the small parts speak to some of the larger ideas that we see in the work. But the one I want to share is, but you and I find each other and know we will stay together in a world that doesn't especially approve of us and the ways we love. And maybe when my mother claimed there was no word for love, she was really saying that no word could encompass all the different ways we find it. And I loved both that he 
does not, he speaks to Larry, his life partner, he references, and you see it also in the end in his acknowledgments, but that is not what the story is about. That's not what he's writing about. And so we see those references of him finding his way and learning who he loves and figuring out how to express that in a community that he feels rejects it and kind of doubly rejects it that he feels like homosexuality is not accepted in the in the reservation community but then also he sees the judgment of the larger community so i feel like there are references to that and again that's not the point of his story but it is part of his life and his search for his identity but what i really loved there also was that it's him speaking to the love that he has come to find, which I think is beautiful. And I think we celebrate that as readers to see that it's one of those moments, like we talked about with the bridges, where we can see that he is experiencing healing and that he is finding something that he's really happy with. I love all of that. But I also love what he said there about there being no word for love and how he's interpreting it in that moment. And I think how complicated his relationship with his mom is. And how they don't say outright a lot of their feelings for so many, in so many instances. I mean, for example, when he gets ready to move away and suddenly she's frantic to keep him from moving away and just how she thought he never would. And then she's trying to undo kind of the things that she said. I mean, I just think all of that was really it just showed that she has so much love for him, but also she's had a hard life and he's so much younger than his siblings. And so we see that the the moment with the blanket, with the threads and her wanting to keep him warm. I mean, I think all of that, we just see these moments of tenderness, but it's maybe not what we traditionally see when somebody's trying to show what love looks like in a relationship. And so that's what I love is like that line, you know, she was really saying that no word could encompass all the different ways we find it. That I think that's what we see in the book as a celebration of how we come to find love for each other amid hard circumstances and what that might look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that too. His relationship with his mom is just, so fun to watch develop. And of course there's some really dark parts, but yeah, I enjoyed all of that too. too. When he's leaving. Oh my goodness. It was beautiful. (laughs) I thought so too. And I mean, and like that was one of the times I thought was kind of humorous that when she Uh was thinking, it was almost like this frantic desperation to come up with what could I say to keep you from going. And I'll say however extreme, you know, I'll make it as extreme (laughs) as I have to to try to change this pathway, which I just thought was really neat. As we said, we could discuss this for a long time. There's so much within it to dig into, but we're going to move on to our pairings and share some recommendations that we have that if you enjoyed this one, books that we think you might enjoy. Sarah, do you want to share yours? So my pairing is Lori Hall Sanderson's Shout. This is also a memoir. It is written in poetry. It talks about violence against women. And I feel like some of the stuff that Eric brings up in his book about residential schools and some of the the ways that indigenous people are treated in our country by white people and other people. I think that I think that if you like the way that this book kind of tackles that, you'll like Lori Haas Anderson's book. And they are similar in that they they move through a, a narrative, but there's also it's not super plot driven, mm-hmm. which is what I would think say about Apple Skin to the Core. Shout is that way too, because she has some, she has stories, personal stories from her life within the book, but also there are some just books, some poems where she is just angry and kind of raging about, you know, the things that have happened to her and the things that have happened to a lot of women. So I think, I think that would be a good pairing for this book and also similar in style. So Mm -hmm. that is Laurie Halls Anderson's shout. Yes, we have talked before about, I mean, I think Laurie Halls Anderson is so great at taking on issues and really speaking to them in a meaningful way. And I agree, Sarah, that her style for a lot of them is, you know, totally different and it often comes in the form of fiction Mm -hmm. and a movement through that, but still speaking to the social issues. But this one I do think is very similar as far as style, just almost snapshots of different Mm -hmm. moments in her life and how those connect to the central issue. What about you, Jen? What's your recommendation? 
So I am pairing this one with Steve Shankin's undefeated Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indian School football team. Shankin is a great nonfiction author for his audience, intended audience is also young adults. And I listened to this one on audio. I've talked about it on here before, but it's been a long time. And I just thought this book was fascinating. So it's focused. The, the man in the title, Jim Thorpe, was a Native American who attended the Carlisle Indian School. He was also an Olympic gold medalist, and he was part of a football team at the Carlisle Indian School, which the school put in place as a way to continue to control the students there. It was both a way to have some regimented time but also something to sort of hold over their heads. So the way that they used it was not always great, but because Thorpe was so talented and the coach was Pop Warner, who the Pop Warner football teams for little kids are named after, they were super successful and they would compete against schools like Ivy League schools. And yet they were not funded nearly as much. And a lot of people would, went in with the expectation that they wouldn't do well. So I think it's one of those great sports stories. It's one of the reasons I love books about sports, but it's also this incredibly detailed, revealing expose of what it was like at the Carlisle Indian School. And because that was such a big part of Apple Skin to the Core, I think this could be an interesting pairing just to kind of spin off and learn about that from a different perspective. So, and again, it's great on audio. I've seen the, a physical copy of the book and the photographs are fascinating, but the audio was great. So again, that's Steve Shankin's Undefeated Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indian School football team. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, that sounds really good. It really, yeah. Shankin is so good. And he just makes these nonfiction stories have such a a forward momentum. And I think they're great for young adults who maybe don't love nonfiction otherwise because he gives them that narrative flow. So it's a great way to introduce kids to nonfiction as well. Ashley, what's your pairing? So I wanted to circle back to one that is very recent. This is Angeline Boley's Firekeeper's Daughter. This one just came out in March and is a young adult novel. Jen shared a review of it on unabridgedpod.com. And I've talked about it some on the podcast as well. And I think that there are so many things, although it is not a memoir, it is not in verse. I think that thematically, Bully is hitting on a lot of similar topics. So Donna Fontaine is the main character. We've shared recently with our bookish check-in, so I'll go brief on the summary here, but I did want to highlight a few things. So she is not an enrolled member of the tribe, but she lives on the reservation. She moves back and forth between the part of her family that is white and the part of her family that is native and is bridging those two worlds. And I think that what I love is Donna's dedication to preserving her heritage and her honor that she feels toward the elders in her community and the way that she is learning their traditions and incorporating them in authentic ways into her own life. I love all of that. I love seeing a teen who is in the present world. She, she's a hockey player. She plays, she had played on the boys league. So she's fantastic as a player. And so she's, you know, very engrossed in, in everything that a teen is excited about. She's an athlete. She is interested in boys. She's got all those things happening. She's thinking about college and making decisions for that. But she also is in that present showing how she can incorporate herbal traditions and herbal medicine. And she has a lot of rituals and routines that are a part of her daily life. And I just really love that. I love seeing that in a young character and a book written for teens that celebrates that in, in an authentic way. And then the other thing that I think we really see is the hard hit on the reservation community of things like meth and drug addiction and how that's happening and being how the, the native community is being exploited in some ways for some of that. And so I just think that there's a lot going on with 
the problems that are happening, again, we talked about long range impact of things like residential schools. I think that we see in Bully's work as well, some of the long range effects of things that happened in the past, but are continuing to impact in negative ways, the native community. And I think all that works really well, but also it's just a great book. It's, there is a mystery at its core. There's a lot to unpack of what's going on. And I just, I think it comes together in a really fascinating way. But like I said, the things that really struck me about the connection to this book are thinking through how to honor and preserve heritage in a, in a lasting and current way in our world today. And I think that Donna Fontaine, her character, she is Firekeeper's daughter. Her father's last name is Firekeeper. And I just think she does that so well. And I really love her as a character. And I like seeing that representation of a, of a girl who can do that, who's found a way to do that and to do it well. And so great book. And if you read it, let us know because I know Jen really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. I love that pairing too. I think that resonates so much. Yeah. So um, that one's on my list. Uh, oh, Sarah, gosh. you're going to love it. I can't wait to hear. I mean, I, I loved know. it. I like, you need to start it today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm just really excited about that one coming out. You know, we sometimes talk about books that we're just so happy to celebrate the book birthday for. And that's definitely true of that one. So again, Angeline Bouley's Firekeeper's Daughter and definitely worth a read. We wanted to wrap up today with our bookish hearts and then our give me one. So we'll do bookish hearts first. Jen, what's your what's your bookish heart number? Yeah, I would say this one gets four bookish hearts from me. Awesome. What about you, Sarah? I am going to reiterate that and give it four bookish hearts. How about you, Ashley? Yep, I'm going with four as well. I absolutely loved the poetry. I think that as we shared at the beginning, it was a surprise in some ways that it did not move in the way that I expected. And so I think that it took me a little while to get into it, but I absolutely loved it. And I think it's it's a beautiful work with really interesting exploration of a lot of different ideas. Okay, we wanted to wrap up today with our Give Me One. Today's topic is a favorite comedian or a person who makes you laugh the hardest. Uh, Jen, what's your choice? So I have been on quite the journey with this response and (laughs) I had a different answer. I don't watch a ton of comedians, but I do. I'm a faithful Saturday Night Live watcher. And I hadn't thought about the fact that so often the hosts are stand up comedians. And one of my favorites, he has been a host multiple times, is John Mulaney. I think his monologues, sometimes the monologues are a little weak. His are always phenomenal. I most often have to pause because I'm laughing too hard to hear his next line. And I don't want to miss a word that he says. I think his delivery is impeccable and he's super, super dry. And I just really love him. So John Mulaney. Awesome. What about you, Sarah? So I don't watch a lot of stand up either, but I tend to love comedy movies and I love SNL. And so I, so even though I don't watch stand up, I like comedy. And I think that comedy that makes, that can make someone laugh out loud, that is a really difficult thing. And one of my favorite com- pers- people that can do that is Kevin Hart. I mm. adore his movie. I, I will watch any movie he is in. <laughs> I, I like some of them better than others, but I'm never sad I watched them. And I especially love his character in Jumanji with, and I, I always like it when he and Dwayne The Rock Johnson <laughs> are paired together because for one thing, Dwayne Johnson is gigantic and Kevin Hart is on the smaller side. And I think that their physical comedy together is just hilarious and they have a really good chemistry together. So my pick is Kevin Hart. Ashley, how about you? I had a hard time with this one too, because as we discussed earlier, (laughs) pop culture is not always my thing, but one person who I absolutely love in the acting world is Dan Levy. And I absolutely loved everything about Schitt's Creek. I've talked about that one on here before. It's one of my most favorite series to watch. And I also just love him as a person. I mean, I think that he, as a personality on social media, I really admire him. And I think he is 
courageous and hilarious and that he does all of that really well. And so I'm here for anything he ever is in. And, you know, I always want to watch what he does and I, and the laugh out loud. I mean, I think I laugh out loud with him more than anybody I could think of. So he's my pick. And speaking of Saturday Night Live, his episode was this season and it was, I think, the best one by far. And I loved him so much. He was totally committed and it was awesome. So. (laughs) Well, thank you all so much for joining us for our book club episode today. We hope that you enjoyed our discussion of Eric Gantworth's Apple Skin to the Core, and we would love to hear what you thought about that and any pairings that you have and would like to recommend. Thanks for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Underbridge Pod or on the web at underbridgepod.com for a list of ways to support us. We'd like to thank Jared Featherstone, who composed our theme music, Strings of Light, and Katie Amy of Amy Photography, our podcast photographer. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.